Welcome to Trucks, episode something. Welcome to possibly the ideal Europe. We are taking... Um, We've got like a cyberpunk dashboard this time. We're taking electronics from uh, the Netherlands to Copenhagen. Yeah, yeah, it's going to be good. Yep. We're going to go to Copenhagen and see more of that DLC. Yeah, right. In fact, we are indeed going to do just that. Uh, and the other thing that we're going to do today is listen to some sick beats. Uh, Josh, would you please oblige? One, two, three, four. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so <laughs> <laughs> the hissing noise helping you all out there with the with your interpretation of that piece. <laughs> well, I'll tell you something that'll help you with the interpretation of that piece. Yeah. Uh, Josh, tell me about how you discovered this particular piece of music. I discovered this piece of music um, by just searching around, listening to some music, and listening to like searching for the person who remakes that thing and the person who remakes that thing. And I eventually ended up on this weird band camp record label dealing in a type of music they call drum funk, mm. um, called Pinecone Moonshine. Is. And uh, this is a track from a Pinecone Moonshine album called They Pal. Mostly Said Nice Things. Pal is, Pal is the name of the track. The album is They Mostly Said Nice Things. And um, the, the thing which distinguishes Pinecone Moonshine music, besides the fact that I think it's very good, is uh, that every single track has a tiny little artist statement. The one for, um, the one for this track reads thusly. Pal opens right away with big band drums and keeps the tempo going with an equally percussive bass line. The harmony is part introspective and a bit distant. Right. Does that help you at all? Does it change the way that you're thinking about the music? For me, um, uh, Isaac and I were discussing this Trucks episode, and we were looking for a particularly good artist statement, and we settled on that one, and then I played the track. Um, and the first thing I said was, oh, those are big band drums. Yes, indeed. So one of the things that artist statement does, and our topic for the day, by the way, is artist statements generally, what they do uh, why to have them, why not to have them, whether as a general matter they're a good or a bad thing, and um, their relative rarity. Yeah. I've got to stop doing that. As it keeps playing things with things on my desk and making a mess of himself. It's okay. These are not my good pants. <laughs> <laughs> I keep, I'll just, I keep a I'll, lot I'll of... Just, I'll just... No, no, no. Just, just let him imagine. All right. Um, I was just going to call them sludge receptacles. Yeah, no. I think that's probably a pretty accurate assessment of what just happened there. Mm. God, I'm all tangy. Anyway. Ooh, it smells. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> anyway. So why have an artist statement on a piece of music? Well, I mean... I think in this case, um, it accomplishes one thing right away, which is it provides evidence of craft, right? I think this is music which could be mistaken for a lot of random noise, if, especially if this isn't your kind of music, if you don't know Aphex Twin, right? Mm -hmm. Like, um, these these drums and these sounds, it's so disharmonious, it's so cacophonic. Yeah. Cacophonic. It's uh, a bit, I mean, it's, but it's also a fact, you know, even if you do know about this music, that it's... Um, a lot easier in this day and age to make electronic music than it used to be. The the tools are in the hands of more people, and uh, there are a lot of you know people who are more conceptual, sort of design-minded folks making this music. And so, um, I think that there is a lot of it that is made where it is debatable how much thought or creative you know intentionality has gone into the making of them. Yeah. And so what this is doing is that it's it's staking a claim on a couple of levels. Yeah. Uh, first, it's being like, well, you know, I know you guys who are electronic music fans care a lot about what micro genre this particular piece of electronic music is part of, because Absolutely. with in electronic music, as in metal or punk or anything, where there's a lot of like antisocial dudes working very hard on a very niche thing for a long period of time, right? Um, sort of micro genres and over classification proliferate yeah. and in this case the particulars of that are that they're distancing themselves a little bit from drum and bass which is the closest thing this sounds like and like drum and bass was this thing i listened to in like the early 2000s when i was playing video games sometimes and i was surprised that it was still around but like the main difference between what you're hearing now and drum and bass is that this doesn't have like a, a traditional driving bass line instead it has weird field recordings and like a sound collage elements, right? And like that, that alone is enough to make it a, a new microgenre in the world of electronic music. Yeah, but th this statement also seems to be saying every track here is going to be a genre unto itself. Um, the we're not. It's the the number of BPM here is not the important thing in terms of what makes this a, a pinecone moonshine product. Mm -hmm. It is both a the vibe that we're creating here. Yeah and B, the intentionality which we're creating here. Yeah. Which leads us to the second half of this particular uh, statement. statement. And not everything on, on Pankan Moonshine does this, but we, I want to draw particular attention to this last sentence. The harmony is part introspective and a bit distant. 
So are you, if you're listening to the harmony now, and you might be, uh, depending on how we've timed this out, does it feel introspective to you? Does it feel distant? Does it feel more that way now than it did, you know, before we said those words? Maybe. Yeah. Um, so music is best uh, in terms of its thematic content in and of itself at per, uh, portraying emotion, mm -hmm. right? It without without words, without lyrics, it's not capable of communicating ideas that are that much more complicated than that. Um, yeah. Unless you are sort of talking like somebody who's synesthetic or it, into enough into sort of classical chord progressions to, to read it as if it were a kind of language of flowers and <laughs> you know there's deviations from established norms and that kind of thing but you know in and of itself mostly it's going to make you feel good bad introspective melancholic ecstatic which raises the question why does an artist statement for pizza music need to explain what the emotional content is since the uh, since if it's doing its job, that should be already happening to you before you see it. And I think in the case of this track, for me, the answer is that uh, the the words are not just about a mood. They are, they are also kind of about the the scene being set, right? Introspective mm -hmm. and distant. Those are words about an internal state, right? Like I think it would have been the, the drum and bass is traditionally a very urban kind of music. It's it's about cityscapes, you know. On the album covers, it's all these black and white pictures of big concrete jungles. Mm -hmm. um, Dance, you know, it's sort of, and, and like, you know, clubs and... Yeah, yeah. Whereas this, and whereas like the, everything about this label from the name of the label, which is like about as far away from an urban idea as you can possibly get yeah. to the art on the, on these particular albums. Here's a few samples, maybe. Um, is trying to pull you away from that and into it's less representation something new. It's more in, 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 introspective, right? It's, yeah. it's an internal. It wants to make an here. introverted drum and bass. Yeah. And so, in this instance, uh, when the music itself may not drag that as much, because music is so much about association, um, even so, you, in order to, for them to get across what they are, these what they're intending to do here. It, in order to drag you away from the associations you might have with this kind of music, you, they do need that extra push. Yeah. And they're giving it. Um, but on the other hand, doesn't it kind of limit your agency as a listener? Um, ideally, in music, um, I are and in, and and like this is this is this is just sort of a posit here. Yeah. Ideally, in, and you know we can take we can we can debate this, but sure. ideally in any art. Um, the art itself should speak on its own merits. It should be self-contained. And in itself, it should have a conversation with you, the viewer, um, which you can take anywhere that you want to. The ideal experience of me, a viewer or a listener, experiencing a piece of music is I take what I take into it. The artist took what he took into it or she took. and something unique happens between those two things right and an attempt by the artist to guide my perceptions and to guide my reading of a given piece um seems kind of overbearing to me and seems like it might be making up for deficiencies in the work itself deficiencies which i don't even think this track has right it almost feels just extraneous in this case mm. to, to me but i think that we can find examples where um an artist statement, uh, you know, very clearly adds a dimension to a work which which may have been present uh, in the in the process of making it, but uh, is a little too specific maybe uh, to come through to the listener, especially with music. Um, an, an example I'm gonna bring up here, I think, I think probably we you've heard enough of that first track. It's probably already over. So here's another. This is by the Caretaker. It's from an album called. Um, What's it called? It's called An Empty Bliss Beyond This World. Mm -hmm. And uh, Isaac, please read that artist statement. The caretaker conjures a quieter, more introspective spirit, lost in his own mind amidst a low lit labyrinth of ever decaying and antediluvian shellac phrases. Sourced from a mysterious collection of 78s, these vague snippets of archaic sonics reflect the ability of Alzheimer's patients to recall the songs of their past, and with them, recollections of places, peoples, moods, and sensations. So rather different from the other one. This one is not uh, trying to to provide evidence of craft. No. Or it, it's uh, more evidence of intention. Like, this is music which I think would be very vulnerable to the criticism that it's rather low effort, you know? It's it's essentially these old these old 40s-ish jazz tunes. Um, big big bandy sort yeah, of things. 
kind of ballroomy, but then pass through some filters to make it sound all echoey and distant. Mm -hmm. um, and then imprinted to a dusty ass vinyl, which which was then recorded, and that's thus the album. I mean, this is something. Right. Uh, despite this, is, so this only does not require a great deal of musicality per se to have produced. Right, but I think the artist statement is very successful in proving um, that it's artistically worthwhile. Uh, I, I do think that this music would have created the the mood it sets out to create, uh, a kind of voidy, deathy mood, uh, where the your relationship to the music is really estranged, uh, even without this statement. But the specifics about Alzheimer's. Uh, deeply compound that effect. Wouldn't you agree? Um, I would. I think that the... Oh, shit. I think that as a listener, um, listening to this independently, while I might, you know, pick up the sort of the disquieting elements of yeah. this, um, we certainly have seen, like, listener comments from people, or we've seen comments on this album from people who are like, oh, yeah, this is good chill-out music. Or like, hey, you know, I, I listen to this while I... You know, while I do my chores or whatever, like these people must live in a dungeon or something. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's like I, I think that it's entirely possible to focus on the, you know, the aspects of the music which are nice, which are nice, which yeah. is sort of what what the remnants of niceness still within yeah, this, yeah, 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 and to sort of gloss over the the spookiness of it, yeah, and. As a listener, I wouldn't have come independently to the idea that I'm inside the, the mind of an Alzheimer's patient. Yeah. Um, and uh, while that doesn't like control my reading of 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 the music, and it certainly, do I think that I probably would, in like whether it doesn't change whether I like or dislike the music. Yeah. Because liking or disliking music is a different uh, is sort of a thing that happens with an immediacy. I mm -hmm, think mm -hmm. um, that can't be thought through like this. Not usually, anyway. Um, I think I kind of came to like Vaporwave the more I thought about it, but that's rare. Yeah, I mean, and well, <laughs> that may say something about Vaporwave, but yeah. um, the... Uh, but re regardless of thinking your way into liking something or not, like, yeah. the immediate visceral reaction isn't going to be changed by that idea. However, it is going to make my experience of it, it's going to navigate my experience of it down a particular path and it's going to deepen that element of it right. to the point where it there is a sort of an oppressiveness to this music yeah. and, a, and a, a suffocating a claustrophobia that, that, that sets in when I listen to it yeah, yeah. that I don't think would have been apparent to me without that uh, note without right. that idea and I also want to mention that I don't think either of these artist statements like set out to do 100% of the work for you in terms of understanding the music. Mm -hmm. they, they kind of pr both provide entryways, but I mean, in the case of uh, The Caretaker, like, the, the, the way the music loops, uh, I found after listening to it for a while, kind of resembled the experience of, you know, thinking about a song from your past, but only really being able to remember one part of it, which gets stuck in your head and you just hear it over and over and over, yeah. like, in a kind of frustrating way. It definitely feels like that sort of state where you're you're half awake and your and your mind is playing something at you and you yeah, can't get yeah. rid of it or like the sort of Oliver Sacks you yeah, know yeah. phantom uh, radio brain injury yeah. stuff and that relates to the content of the artist statement but it's not in there uh, and in the case of uh, the Pinecone Moonshine track Pal um, like there's a humor in that track which is not mentioned at all in the artist statement absolutely there's there's doingies yeah there's there's, right. there's there's literally the do you ever own one of those old keyboards with all the the funny the funny sounds it could make and one of them was the orchestral boom yeah like that's just straight up what the, the sound that track ends on after establishing it once earlier in the track and that's yeah it, it's the it's the it's the like it's the drum and bass equivalent of going da 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 at the end <laughs> yeah um, pretty much and um I, I mean, and so the the this, the artist statement and the the a the artist statement b the design c every everything about how this music is is uh, presented um, by the curator yeah really wants to distract you from that part. It doesn't want you to think of this as silly music, right? Even though the artist clearly intended it for it to be somewhat silly. <laughs> Maybe. I, I feel like some of the artist statements on that website have referred to the humor present in the tracks, but I, my my interpretation is a little bit more charitable, I suppose. I, mm. I just thought he wanted to let the let the listener uncover that as a nice surprise, right? Sure. But, um, yeah, either way, like, 
there's layers to this music. Even even the simple caretaker music that uh, on that you can only uncover by hearing it, right? Absolutely. The the artist statement will never stand in for the art, almost never. It's very hard to think of a case where that might might happen. Okay. Um, there are cases where the artist statement like applies to a really crappy piece of art, and it's like really reaching to make it more than it is. Yeah, we went to a, a, a show recently uh, called the, the Neck and the Body by Kaki King, um, where, it, you know, it's a music performance, but it's a, it's a sort of multi, uh, it's a multimedia light show thing where light is projected onto this guitar as yeah. it plays it, and there, there's an artist statement, and there's a playbill, and right. um, one got the impression watching the work that the concept was pulling a lot of the weight. Right. Um, this might have th- this might have something to do with the fact that Isaac and I just didn't care for the music, right? Yeah, and once again, you know, that's going to be up or down, you know. Yeah. But there wasn't a lot of complexity in the music yeah. either. I mean, if if you want to think about it objectively, um, this also happens in sculpture, though. Like um, my Monica and I recently went to see a show in the MoMA uh, by, I think George Gober was his name, um, and like there's this one piece, laughable, laughable piece of sculpture. Um, Basically, it consisted of a wedding dress in the middle of the room, which was lined with a wallpaper with just a repeating image of a a black man hanging from a noose. Mm. And there were, like, uh, I I think it was baby care products just, like, stuffed into the corners, right? And, like, the artist's statement was seemingly trying to do so much work here. It it said something about how the... the, um, the the fucking wallpaper was a reminder of the 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 background radiation of racism that exists in this country whilst we just try to enjoy our happy domestic uh, existences represented by the wedding dress and the baby products were the fulcrum I, I believe it literally referred to it as the fulcrum on which the the entire piece swings you know like right this is preposterous you I mean there there's definitely a school of of art and a school of performance and, and installation art, particularly, uh, where it's like you might as well have just written the fucking <laughs> statement. You yeah, know? you came up with an idea, and the execution does not add anything to your idea. Yeah, so you might as well have just written the idea down. And this was actually something that uh, hit me very hard uh, in senior year of writing school. Is that I was always trying to make my fiction mean things, right? I, there was always a specific idea I wanted to communicate with my fiction. And then one day, while reading Borges, it just hit me: Hey, shit! I can just write the idea down. Like I could be, I could be an essayist <laughs> and like skip all this this crap I'm putting myself through. Uh-huh. And, and that's what I've been doing ever since, right? So I mean, there's definitely something to that. But at the best of times, an artist statement I think augments a work of art. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Right. And it, it is the art. The, I think that like you know, and it's a gradient. I think some some art requires a statement. Um, and some art doesn't. Yeah. And some art is fun, and it, some art uses its statement as a crutch. Yeah. Um, so let me let me go. We could go in one of two directions from there. Yes. I think that uh, the next thing that I want to listen to is a piece that comes without an artist statement of any kind. Okay. Uh, this is by Tumblr user Lamezone, um, and uh, we should be listening to it now. Yep. Uh, the it comes without any metadata whatsoever. The only uh, thing that you have to contextualize you is this image. This image. There it is. Um, does that help? It doesn't help me. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I and, mean, I like the music, but well, the, the image well, does nothing for me. Well, so and, and so this is the thing, right? It's like this, by, by virtue of not being sold, by not existing on a on like a, a, a website with a product description, uh, without any words about you know what it is or why it's there whatsoever, um, it just stands on its own, mm-hmm. and that's I think you know there's definitely a, a level on which that could be a barrier of entry to folks who are going to be more interested in a piece of music if they can understand what it means. Yeah. Um, but for me, it's really refreshing in a way to have a piece that is, or to listen to a piece of music that does not even have the sort of basic background radiation of contextualization that we... Yeah, not even music reviews to help you with that. It, it, right, like nobody's talking about it. Um, 
it, or if they are, I can ignore them talking about it. You know, <laughs> the artist is very clearly has nothing to say about it beyond here's the vibe. Yeah. And if the music does not give you the vibe, then the music has failed. So there's nothing else to say. Sure. Um, and that's something that I find very um, admirable. Um, and uh, it's something also that like is sort of like s- swats both at the idea of of the scene mm-hmm. and at the idea of uh, skill being necessary or important. Yeah, um, craft. I guess is the word that I was looking for there. Um, I don't care how this was made. Yeah, you know, I just like to be in it. Right. Um, but that's partially because it has uh, it has no meaning right Mm -hmm. one of the things that you were or it has no explicit meaning one of the the things about that uh, about that sculpture that you were talking about that made it absolutely necessary for it to have an artist statement was that it was dealing with um, issues that are super it fraught. was dealing with some fraught shit and yeah. I, not very well but but like that made it necessary for them to kind of say what the hell they were going you absolutely for. you know it's sort of the thing where like if you're going to pick that stuff up you have to you have to put it down and if you are going to not explain yourself while you're doing it um it requires a monumental level of effort indeed and real specificity and care yeah um, we, which, this, which that dude was not bringing to the table. Yeah, but um, <laughs> I don't. Th- I don't think that you need to. I don't think that it, it's reasonable to expect that people should have to get it all right and all down in the thing if they're going to address stuff like that. Yeah, I mean, I, we have a positive example of this. Mm-hmm. Um, it's a. It, we'll we'll play the track maybe, but it's really more the music video that matters here. So I'll link to that. But uh, there's a track called "A Tooth for an Eye" by The Knife. Um, which has the following artist statement. A tooth for an eye deconstructs images of maleness, power, and leadership. Who are the people we trust as our leaders and why? What do we have to learn from those we consider inferior? In a sports setting where one would traditionally consider a group of men as powerful and in charge, an unexpected leader emerges. A child enters and allows the men to let go of their hierarchies, machismo, and fear of intimacy as they follow her into a dance. Their lack of expertise and vulnerability shines through as they perform the choreography. Amateurs and skilled dancers alike express joy and a sense of freedom. There is no prestige in their performance. The child is powerful, tough, and sweet all at once. Roaring, I'm telling you stories, trust me. There is no shame in her girliness. Rather, she possesses knowledge that the men lost a long time ago. Right. So, I mean, this statement does the work of uh, guiding you towards a particular interpretation of the video, and I think it does so successfully. I... I I, uh, I think I wouldn't have cared for that video as much as I did without that statement attached to it. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think more importantly, it's trying to make sure that nobody will come out of this video with the wrong interpretation, right? Like nobody's yeah. nobody's gonna watch it with this huge, like kind of r- almost humorously uh, long uh, artist statement for a, you know a, a music video for a pop song, um, mm-hmm. like makes it impossible for anyone to watch this thing and and say like, oh how funny, like these these guys are being led around by a little girl that's weird yeah or, or you know that th- that's like or we're making fun of the guys here right you uh, know it's like i i said before and we, you can argue that the video itself uh does that work and i think it does but people are still gonna manage to 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 yeah absolutely there's like there's a there's a i think that there's it was we've discussed here before there was a responsibility if you're if you're picking up thing, themes that are difficult to do your due diligence to minimize the extent to which, like, fucked up people can take your work and use it as a rallying cry. Yeah. Um, and having a statement like that up front does a lot of the work. Um, also, like, I don't think that there is a lot... I don't think... It, it would be very difficult, I think, to view that video and be like, haha, look at those queers, you know? Yeah. But it might be, like, possible to read that video and be like, haha, masculinity is bullshit. Right. Which is not quite what they're saying yeah yeah you know it's something a little bit more uh subtle than that a little, and, a little more nuanced and there's and it requires a paragraph more joyful ex- yeah it, more more affirmative more yeah. affirming and like more of a way a way in which masculinity can be transformed and transformative and so having the fucking paragraph long artist statement out in front is um is in that way like both 
powerful and necessary. Yeah. On the other hand, that artist statement is totally written in artist <laughs> statement language. Yes. Which you know, you having you know having collaborated with Monica on some statements for her work are versed in. There is a certain um, there's a certain vocabulary and a certain cadence associated with artist statements that I think is common to all three of these artist statements, which is like sixty percent bullshit by weight. Maybe. Um, I mean, there are going to be better and worse ones, but like the form invites scorn. Yes. I mean, my, my struggle with the artist statement has often, uh, when trying to write them, it's been that uh, the artist, uh, basically, I'm, I'm playing the editor role here, right? And Monica needs an artist statement because yeah. school tells her she does. She doesn't want to have one at all. And, like, maybe rightly so, you know? Maybe maybe she's correct that it's going to add nothing to her mm -hmm. work. But I'm trying to just start from the assumption that we should express everything this art is about, right? And if um, if we need to pare it down from there to leave some, some mystery, some room for interpretation... Fine, we can do that, but uh, it, it's a, it's a tough. This this basically this just retreads everything we've talked about that you have to strike a, a, a balance between these two things. But mm -hmm. uh, we ain't, we aren't get doing any hard and fast rules here, you know, yeah. despite the fact that it's less. You know, sorry, you know, <laughs> the answer again is that you have to be careful and do something that's kind of in the middle. Right, a surprise. But I think um, there's a work uh, that comes to my mind, uh, which um, very intentionally has no artist statement, and that is Bloodborne. Are you ready to talk about Bloodborne a little Holy bit? Holy shit! Can I before before we get into that? <laughs> yes. Can I, can I just say that like before we abandon music entirely because yes. music is a particularly extreme example of this thing being in a, uh, so difficult to put meaning on yeah, yeah. its own self. Like like I know our our friends our friend Dunk who we've talked about music reviewing on this uh, program before. Uh, he like there you may have you may you may have heard of the of the uh, a, a four album piece of music, a four disc piece of music called Disintegration Loops by William Basinski mm. wherein he takes some old tape loops and plays them over and over again until they disintegrate and There appears to be no gas at this gas station Ooh, it's an ornamental gas station oh, Okay, well, maybe, maybe it's over there I'll go sleep at least um, uh, And this ends up being about 9-11 <laughs> um, the, I don't, you know, it's it, it might have been the critics who did that to him and not his own artist statement, but I think it was his own artist statement that did that. Uh, and, like, the utter contempt that my buddy has for anything that is self-serious and pretentious <laughs> uh, just bloomed, you know, and he vomited all sorts of vile all over this piece. <laughs> um, and, like, I think that you have to be aware that uh, part of the whole doing an artist statement thing in this format is about, or part, one of the uh, one of the one of the byproducts of that is going to be that you're going to immediately shut yourself off from a lot of people who might otherwise have been interested in your work because they'll feel the reek of uh, pretension. That's true. Upon it, and in the case of Basinski, I feel like that's well deserved. <laughs> but you know. Your mileage may vary. But anyway, yeah, we're, we're finally going to talk about Bloodborne. All right, so here's the thing about Bloodborne. I'm, I'm not going to go into too much detail about my reading because that's not the point here. But in short, to me, Bloodborne was a game about um, gender and uh, race to an extent and uh, kind of making taking horror tropes and making them more compassionate, old horror tropes, right? Right. Um, for, uh, for somebody else... It might be about all the the Catholic imagery and the way it it handles that. For someone else, it might just be a send up of Lovecraft. Uh, uh, I had a conversation with someone on Twitter recently, um, for whom they they couldn't really handle Bloodborne because the imagery to them was too fascist. Like uh, in in Bloodborne, you you spend a lot of time um, slaughtering slaughtering villagers uh, in much fancier dress than them. Um, possibly by means of, of like punishing the the city that you've you've entered for its for its opulence and for its corruption, mm. um, and it's like yeah that's a pretty valid reading too. The thing with Bloodborne like Bloodborne is an extremely textual game, and I, I it's kind of sacrosanct to say that like every, all art is text, like all art can be read however you want. But I feel like the the Souls games in Bloodborne. Um, kind of go out of their way to not deliver any particular messaging but to 
basically to pick a bunch of stuff up without putting it down, right? Right. And um, I mean, like all artists, maybe text, but you know, so are Aesop's fables. Yeah. Right. Like you know, there, are, there, there, are, there's going to be art that wears its intentionality on its sleeve, no matter what it is. And, yeah. And there's some that isn't. And the Souls games, like, seem it seems almost like the entire point of them. I mean, Miyazaki has talked famously about how um, Miyazaki, the director of these games, has talked famously about how his 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 process for making these games is, is inspired by his reading books as a kid, like Western fantasy novels that were above his reading level and in a different language. So there were parts that he just kind of couldn't understand, but for him that was part of the pleasure, right? Like filling in the gaps. Oh, good idea. See everything that I've put on the internet like in the last year in terms of <laughs> yeah, yeah. the love of mistranslation. Yeah, and like that's I think that's a really cool idea, but it, it does like it does not do the work at all, uh, which we have earlier in this episode said is necessary and praiseworthy of um, making sure that the, the reader, viewer, whatever, doesn't come away with a retrograde, a retrograde interpretation. Yeah, but on the other hand, um, as I also said earlier, uh, it f- pulls off the idea of being a thing unto itself. Yeah, and it's like I think that it's a it's a common uh, or almost sort of a, tr- a truism uh, among critics that a work that you could have five or ten different re- like legitimate readings of yeah that's a sign of good work that's a sign of density that's yeah. a sign of depth yeah that's a sign of complexity um, and a sign that this is a work that's likely to be talked about and to continue to be talked about. Uh, Don't worry about it. I'm not worrying about it. <laughs> There's something on the screen that you can't see. That's fine. Um, oh, it's Nepeta. Hello. <laughs> uh, anyway. Um, so, I... Uh, and and I, I this reminds me of, of, a, of a post that I actually saw on my, our good buddy uh, Mercurial Malcontents uh, Tumblr recently, wherein uh, a, a questioner was asking her about the plot of uh, Mother 3 hmm. um, and was saying, well, Mother 3 has a fairly overt uh, anti-capitalist message. Um, the plot, of, there's sort of this anti-Diluvian town in Mother 3 mm-hmm. uh, and then like a, 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 a person who is like literally a pig in a turban comes to town and invite and brings in things like currency and television dude and I, I, uh, i'm sorry to interrupt but look at this giant fucking bridge we're crossing that's beautiful this must be the bridge between denmark and norway mm-hmm. that's pretty intense this dlc gets an a plus so far please carry yeah. on but anyway uh, uh this so uh, somebody's literally a pig in a turban comes into town and, and spreads like currency when they're on a barter system and television and all this stuff around and then, uh, and then opens a factory where people like you know work on an assembly line, and then give me one sec. eventually brings all of them. Uh, Carry on. Eventually, um, basically, uh, uh, entices all of the people to move from their little town to the big city, which is basically just a Hollywood cardboard cutout, you know, frontage of what he thinks a big city would look like. Mm. Um, and it turns out the guy behind this has been an eight-year-old for like thousands of years. <laughs> um, so pretty overt yeah. message. Um, and the person was like, "Does that not perforce make the story bad? Mm. Because subtlety is good." And um, it's hard to say. Mercury was like, "Well, I don't, <laughs> I don't think it's that simple." And yeah. it isn't that simple, partially because. Um, there are often like in it there there's a lot of stuff going on that's sort of another layer above that in this story yeah, um, yeah. and like there's a lot you know there's definitely the argument to be made that the sort of eden of the of the original uh village is you know not as is not nearly as as pretty as is it as it's cracked up to be and is the result of you know previous sins and you know all of this there's a it, it's the the thing itself is more complex the more you look at it but also it's just that it's like it's not bad to make a story that has some stuff in it that means something like really <laughs> loudly yeah right like we just saw mad max right you know it's okay to do broad strokes sometimes <laughs> yeah it's like and it's a genre by genre thing you know if you this know? were a children's fable like you wouldn't blink at it 
Right. I mean, it, it, it's a it's a game for kids. Also, <laughs> um, <laughs> just reminding you. <laughs> but uh, the I, I think I think that like as a writer, the question that that this brings up to me is you know, well, do, I mean. How how much explaining do I want to do in my story? Yeah, you know, do I do, is it is it worse if somebody misses it, or is it worse if I hit him over the head with a hammer? It depends, I guess. It, uh, it depends. It depends. You want to try and do it's, it's a big solo. Of it depends. You know, at the end of this, <laughs> it episode, all depends. It, just, it, just, it just depends on what you're doing, man. If but. there was an artist statement for trucks, what would it be? Two doofuses, mm. um, or whatever the plural for doofus is. Mm -hmm. Doofy. Doofy. Um, uh, drive an imaginary truck around an imaginary Europe, which symbolizes both the meandering nature and the ultimate artificiality of their uh, both their discourse and their personalities. Nice. Thank you very much. Do you think? Do you think that? Expressing the values of trucks more intentionally than we do mm. could help the people who might like it find it. Yeah, well, the values of trucks, that's an interesting thing because one of, the, one of those things that, that an artist statement you know, implies about a, a piece of art is that it has a mission statement. Right. It has values in well, a way that, I, it, I meant that value, like, a KFC does. That this, is, this is all very uh, uh, true, what you're saying, but I, I meant value in the sense of uh, the value that we think it has, the worth of it, I suppose right. would be a better word. Yeah. Um, if we were to say, like, hey, isn't this, like, you know, and this is, this is actually something that has been said about trucks, in which I think it's probably my favorite thing that's been said about trucks, is that it, it's like falling asleep in the back seat listening to the grown-ups talk. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Um, there's the value of it, yeah. Um, which is partially, which is one of the reasons why I miss there being music on the radio, is because, well, I mean, and th here's another thing: we might disagree about what the things on it. A in the second season of Trucks, we have been, we have, uh, we have dedicated ourselves to thinking through what we want to say beforehand, doing the prep, having some like actual stuff, like items that are in the real world to discuss, yeah, and sticking with the same subject all the way through. Um, and we have turned off the cabin radio so that you can hear what we're saying because, the, and this implies that we think that what we're doing right now is more important right. because it's more considered. Yeah. Whereas one of the things that I like yeah. about the old trucks, and one of the things that I like about art in general, and CF, you know, lamezone.tumblr.com here, is I love the ephemeral, I love the, the non serious, I love the abstract i love the stuff that sort of melts and i love the inexplicable yeah and the early trucks to me are just like why are they even doing this and what is going <laughs> on but maybe i kind of like it and we got some fans who are just sort of like yeah i'm just gonna sort of bask in this shit yeah i mean nobody yeah. nobody's complained that we're not doing that anymore yet but i, do, I don't think i, 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 miss don't, it I don't think anyone's listening i mean <laughs> let's, let's just be honest that's there's, true there's nobody listening that's to this, true but that, that is the whole thing but yeah you know Still, maybe we'll do another one of those someday. One of those goofy things where we have nothing to talk about. And we're both a little drunk. Yeah, and we'll and we'll put like you know we'll put Rachmaninoff on the car stereo yeah. and we'll, <laughs> we'll swoon yeah. around the whole bit. But you know, what 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 this is, you know, what what trucks is, and here's my here's my my serious artist statement mm -hmm. is that it's a journey, mm. and in life it's not the destination. It's not Norway. Where the electronics need to go, it is the des It is the journey. That no, it's that. It Maybe the trucks <laughs> was the friends we made along the way, all along. <laughs> That's what I was trying to say. That yeah. is, in fact, word for word, what I was trying to say. And you know, I guess it makes sense that trucks uh, has changed into something that's trying to be a little bit more serious because that's exactly what I'm doing. Yeah. And I'm the daddy of trucks. He, J Josh is the daddy of trucks, and um. In some ways, trucks is about m our friendship, Josh mm. and mine. That's but true. I think more fundamentally, it's about Josh. Ah, uh. yeah. Because I'm disposable. That's not true. You, you know, you you all know this. Trucks yeah. would not be the same I without just, Isaac. I could just you know walk out of the room and be exactly the same thing. The value. Hey man, his Dark Souls thing. It's so much better than any of this because it's just Josh. <laughs> well, it's not because it's just me. It's no, because it's I. Not. It's because I wrote it's cause it. You actually wrote it out. <laughs> That's the only <laughs> That's reason. Important. <laughs> But um, no, I mean, trucks would not be the same without Isaac. The, the value Isaac brings is that I can, I can say, hey, here's an interesting thing. 
I'm not sure why it's interesting, and then Isaac will be able I'll to I'll tell say, you why it's interesting. Yeah, Isaac will, like, yeah. nail it, yes. But... The, 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 the import, I wasn't just saying, you know, it's me and Josh in the cabin, because it's not just me and Josh in the cabin, it's you in the non-existent backseat of this truck. Um, it's, Can't even look back there. Yeah, we, you, you, you are, are, you, our children, are, you know, are notional at best, <laughs> but we love you anyway. And it's that sort of cozy, dusky feeling that I feel like we want to... Uh, achieve here when all is said and done. Trucks.com. When all is said and done, and the final the final truck has driven along the final road, mm-hmm. leave us a comment, like and subscribe. <laughs> <laughs> Tell us what the artist statement of trucks is. Yes. in the comments, please. You think I should try and park? It's one of these tough ones where I have to do it at kind of a right angle. Nah, fuck it. I don't think we're going to improve on what we just did in terms yeah. of an ending. All right, guys. Thanks for listening. Peace out. Let's let's get the rating. Good work. Nicely done. Good work. It's telling us that we're doing good work. Doesn't, cool. th- doesn't that feel good? I'm just going to wipe the ketchup off my pants. Okay, goodbye, everybody.